I have three responsibilities as a commander of U.S. Army Europe. Number one is to ensure the readiness, the preparation of all American soldiers and our allies to do our job. My second responsibility is to ensure that the land forces of NATO are as good as they can be to do their job. And my third responsibility is training young leaders, helping young men and women develop their full potential so that they can be as effective as they, as they need to be to accomplish their mission as officers, non-commissioned officers in the U.S. Army. I need them to be willing to take risk. I need them to use their initiative in a military environment. I need them to be creative. And I need to impress on them the importance of small individual actions having a larger outcome, a strategic effect. In fact, they may be the senior American commander in a country, even as a lieutenant or a young captain, and yet I need them to be effective. So I spend a lot of effort and time on developing these young leaders. And one of the ways I like to do this is with telling stories about other leaders who have been successful, who have the traits of initiative, risk-taking, determination, and understanding the big picture. And I do it with rocks. I collect rocks from battlefields all over the world. I have about 300, actually. Um, and I have, this is the important part. I have to be sure that that rock was an eyewitness, that the rock was there, even if it was in the year 9 AD when Hermann de Cherusker uh, defeated three Roman legions uh, near Kalkariza. I go to that spot to find the rock. Now, sometimes it causes me to do crazy things. For example, I took my daughter when she was five years old, and I held her by her feet and lowered her into the River Meuse uh, so that she could collect a rock off the bottom of the river. Uh, my son, when he was a, a young man, I had him walk out into the middle of the creek near Valley Forge in Pennsylvania, which was George Washington's headquarters during one of the most important winters of our revolution, because I wanted to be sure that that rock was there when George Washington was there way back over 200 years ago. So how did I, how did I get started on this? Lieutenant Eric Fisher Wood was a lieutenant in 1944, a brand new officer in a brand new unit. He was in a division, about 14,000 soldiers that had just arrived in, on the European front towards the end of the Second World War. And in fact, his unit was put into a place near here in the Schnee Eiffel because it was such a new unit, the army thought this is a good place for them to go. It's quiet, it's peaceful, the war is almost over. It's a good place for them to uh, get some experience, become accustomed to being uh, in the war zone. Of course, 16 December 1944, that was exactly the place when the Wehrmacht launched its counteroffensive to try and win the war. They attacked right at the exact spot where Lieutenant Wood's unit was positioned. As you can see, it was a disaster. It was the biggest defeat the United States Army suffered in all of the Second World War. Thousands of American soldiers were killed, captured, or simply disappeared. But Lieutenant Wood was a different kind of person. He realized that his job was to continue the fight, to do the best he could. And so for the next two weeks, he continued resisting, he continued fighting, looking for other uh, survivors, if you will, to keep up the fight for as long as they could. Even though he had nobody above him telling him what his job was, he knew what he needed to do. He had been taught to do that. And so Lieutenant Wood kept up the fight for another two weeks. He eventually was killed. And at the end of the war, the Belgians and his father found the site and erected a small memorial to where Lieutenant Wood had been killed. I was a lieutenant, 1981, as I mentioned. My battalion commander, my boss, he knew the story of Lieutenant Wood. And he went to the site of the memorial and picked up an armload of rocks from that site and then gave one to every lieutenant in our unit and said, that's what I expect of you. In chaos, when it's uncertain, people, there's trouble all around you, I need you to figure out what your mission should be, to take responsibility, to use your initiative, and continue the fight. So I've had that rock on my desk every job I've had since 1981. And this is my Lieutenant Eric Fisherwood rock, and I carry it with me everywhere I go. 
So I thought, what a great idea to have a story that talks about young leaders who are willing to take risk, use initiative, or that understand the impact that they can have on a larger outcome. Joshua Chamberlain commanded something, that, a unit that we call the 20th Maine, a U.S. Army Infantry Unit in the American Civil War. You know the American Civil War was from 1861 to 1865. 1863 was the decisive year. And the town of Gettysburg in eastern Pennsylvania, a small town north of Washington, D.C., was the site of the most important, decisive battle of the entire American Civil War. It lasted for three days, July the 1st, July the 2nd, and July the 3rd in 1863. Colonel Chamberlain's unit, a small unit, had the responsibility on the far left flank, the end of the line for this battle. He was told, do not let the rebel forces get behind you. If they do, it could be the end of the army, and more importantly, the rebel forces would then be between the Union Army and the capital of Washington, D.C. The war could be lost in one day if Colonel Chamberlain failed. So his men fought all day long on the 2nd of July. They were constantly under attack by heavier forces. They kept fighting, but eventually they were almost out of ammunition. Colonel Chamberlain knew that this fight could not go on much longer. So he did something that was completely different from the doctrine of the time. He had his men attack. From Little Round Top, this small rocky outcrop on the far west left end of the American uh, line, he attacked downhill into the much larger attacking force, which so completely surprised the rebel forces that they dropped their weapons and retreated immediately. So the quick thinking, audacious tactic used by Colonel Chamberlain is what saved the army that day, is what saved my country. Now, Colonel Chamberlain was not a professional soldier. He was a college professor before the, the American Civil War started, but he volunteered, like hundreds of thousands of other young men, to be soldiers to save our country. Waterloo, 1815. Napoleon has come out of exile. He's brought together, reassembled his huge army, and they're marching into Belgium. And so Wellington is, brings together a coalition of soldiers, and they meet on the field of battle at Waterloo. Lieutenant Colonel McDonnell, a Scottish officer, is the commander of the Coldstream Guards. It's a famous unit, great history, and he had a great reputation as a, as a professional soldier. Wellington takes Colonel McDonnell and tells him, I need you to go into the farm of Hougamont on the right flank of Wellington's line, you cannot let the French get behind us. You cannot let the French turn the right flank of our line. If they do, they'll be behind us. It'll destroy the British Army. And more importantly, it'll be between the British Army and their base back on the coast. So Colonel McDonough, McDonald uh, and his men prepare Hougamont for the fight. It's a small group of soldiers. And the attack begins on the morning of the, 5th, of the 18th of June. And all morning, the French, wave after wave after wave of soldiers are attacking Colonel McDonnell and his Coldstream Guards. The British did not have enough forces to send reinforcements, but they were able to keep providing ammunition. However, at some point during the battle, Colonel McDonnell noticed that the gate in the back of the farm had been left open. And the French saw that it was open at the same time. So Colonel McDonnell and Sergeant Graham together rushed to the gate as the French were trying to force their way in, they were able to force the gate closed again and secure it so that they could continue to fight. The French spent hours trying to go after Hougamont. Eventually, the attack failed, and they shifted their effort uh, farther to their right. The small unit led by Colonel McDonnell and the efforts of Sergeant Graham saved the right flank of Wellington's army and saved Wellington's army. 1981 to 1984, I served in Graustadt, Germany, and uh, we still had a divided Germany. You still had East Germany, West Germany, and you still had the city of Berlin divided into East Berlin and West Berlin. The wall, the mauer, was still there. So I had the privilege to go visit Berlin five times. Once, as a, with my unit, we went into uh, West Berlin to conduct training in the how to fight in a city. Uh, but four times I went with friends 
uh, on a weekend to visit a friend that lived in West Berlin. It was very scary. I was a very young officer, and the process to get from West Germany, at Helmstedt, into Berlin was a very, very strict process. You go through the checkpoint, the American checkpoint at Helmstedt, and then you immediately are, have to go through a Soviet checkpoint. Big Russian soldiers are there. You go into a small wooden shack. Uh, there was a picture of uh, President Brezhnev. He was the president of the Soviet Union at the time. And there was a small window, like at a bank, except only an opening at the bottom. So you have to walk there, and you put your papers. These two big hands come out. They take the papers, close the window, and then you can hear something's going on. They're making copies or whatever, and then they stamp it. The window opens up. They slide your papers back out, and then you can go. So then you go back into your car. You hear dogs barking. You see barbed wire, big searchlights. Uh, it was a scary environment, to be honest, for a young officer. And then you have two hours to drive from Helmstedt to Berlin. You cannot get off the road. You have to keep moving forward. And then you reverse the process at the other end. You come back to another Soviet checkpoint. You show the papers. They record the time that you arrived. And then you're in. You made it. You're in West Berlin, like an, an oasis almost. Uh, the difference between West Berlin and East Berlin, between West Germany and East Germany, was literally like day and night. The, the freedoms, the opportunities, um, the creativity in West Germany and in West Berlin was completely different from what you saw in East Berlin. It was depressing. They were on the other side of a wall. I knew, though, that something was rotten on the inside. One of the times that I went to Berlin, I stayed in the car while my partner went in to do the paperwork. And when you're in the car, you're supposed to stay there and keep looking straight ahead, don't do anything because you're being recorded. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye, and this was, it was very cold, there was a Russian soldier that came out of the building and he was not wearing a jacket. He was wearing just a, a shirt. And I thought, wow, these Russians, they really are tough. And uh, he comes up to the car and he walks around my car two times, but I'm just, I'm just sitting there watching. And then he stops by my window and looks in the window and he raises up his shirt, and he has three belts, Russian army belts on, three of them, and then he does that. He wanted five German Deutschmark for a belt. Remember, I was a very young lieutenant. I said, hell yes. So, <laughs> so I rolled, and by the way, windows, you used to have to do this to lower the window. Uh, and I gave him five marks, and he took off the belt and gave me the belt. Of course, I still have that. But that was when I realized that something it was rotten, that a soldier would risk all that to get five Deutschmark for a belt. So when I think about my own contribution to um, spend three years as a lieutenant and then the hundreds of thousands of other American soldiers that served in West Germany during the Cold War and British soldiers and French soldiers and Dutch soldiers and German soldiers uh, and the German people, hoping one day that if each of them did their part, that that wall would come down. And so it did come down. So now we do have a unified Berlin. We do have a unified Federal Republic of Germany. We do have a unified German people that is now a leader in Europe. That's my rock. And my question to you is, what will be your rock? What will you do? What legacy will you leave that makes a difference? Thank you. Thank you.